Welcome to the Why Not Podcast with me, Chrissy Hawkins. In a world where everybody always asks why, I'm here to ask why not. I'll be breaking down the mindsets of guests as well as my own in a bid to find out what makes people say why not. Hi and welcome back to Why Not. So today I have an interview with Jane O'Toole. So she is nutritionist and owner of Real Nutrition. We talked today about some of the traps that we fall into in weight loss. So how we actually, and originally I had asked her about some body image things, but we actually went on a whole kind of psychological talk today instead and different uh, mind shifts and mentalities people had. She talked about her own story and what led her to nutrition and how she fell into the same traps as well growing up. And we also go on a little side rant about social media and the feely feels, but I'm not going to explain the feely feels until we get to that in the episode. So again, great episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. Remember, as ever, sit back and relax or walk and listen, whatever way. Here is my episode with Jane O'Till. Hi guys and welcome back to Why Not Podcast. So today I have got Jane O'Toole. So Jane is a nutritionist and her business is also called Real Nutrition. You may have seen her on Instagram, but I'm going to let Jane introduce herself a little bit here as well. So welcome to the podcast, Jane. How are you? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. <laughs> so do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? I can do that. Yeah, my name is Jane O'Toole. I said I am a nutritionist based in Dublin. I have my own business, Real Nutrition, and through that I do one-to-one coaching, consultations, I do guest speaking, workshops, things like that, some online talks and content creation for some businesses. And then I also work as a coach with Shane Walsh Fitness, the team there. Um, Yeah, and I have been working in nutrition now, I've been in the industry for about seven years, steadily. Oh, okay, so a long time. Yeah, from building my studies and then throughout the time just kind of growing and developing on them and working towards being a marketer, trying to get into nutrition, to finally being full-time nutritionist over the course of the last year. So finally realized realized the goal of becoming full-time and working for myself in nutrition. No, that's brilliant. How did you get into nutrition? So I like, oh, well... I'd say about 10 years ago, it's kind of was a lot of different things kind of aligning. I I believe I always was seeking work that I felt of service, that I had purpose. I like helping people. It's always been a big part of the work I've done. Whatever work I've been in, there's been an element of working with the public, be it through the service industry, even taking the journey to go into PR and marketing just felt like something that I should do because I was good with people, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And... I myself had quite a transformative impact of getting into new, uh, into fitness and training. Like I would have started training about 10 years ago, 19 years ago, I started getting into CrossFit and strength training. And I'd had my battles through my life with quite a distorted relationship with food, really poor body image, really low self-esteem, something I struggled with incredibly and had ups and downs with throughout my life. And getting into strength training and getting into fitness to the degree that I did really transformed how I viewed my body. I started to really value what my body could do. I started to see it in a different light. I started to care more about what I could lift, if I could run faster, wanting to get a pull up. Um, These things started to become my priority. So I started to view my body in a very very different way and appreciate it in new ways ways and what it could do instead of just constantly criticizing it just want to move thinking I need to lose weight or just you know that that was always my focus previously because my weight would have gone up and down quite significantly throughout my life from being overweight to being very very underweight too and so getting involved in fitness really changed that for me and but it it at least set the fire under me to step change and to start on a journey that's never ending towards you know it's just, it's these days like oh yeah I got it. it helped heal me but you're, you're constantly working on these things throughout your life but it definitely was hugely impactful and starting me on the path towards repairing my own body image my own relationship with food and then in turn inspired me to 
really want to help others do the same. And I did do my CrossFit coaching, kettlebell coaching, all those things, and thought training was going to be more the route I would go. But I always had an interest in food and nutrition. It was always something that I had an interest in, even though my relationship with food was disordered. I did care about nourishment and fueling my body. That interest was always there. And it just seemed like a direction that like drew me in. And then once I started my studies, and then obviously being in the gym environment, I had an opportunity to work with people. Do I started doing like group challenges, things like that. And then through that, steadily built onto one-to-one. Someone who is quite driven and passionate, and especially when it comes to helping people, I would I would always be quite, uh, I would question myself a lot, quite hard on myself by nature. And yeah, yeah it's like, and I, I, it's something I work on as well, quite a lot. And it's like, being really hard on myself, I always was like, I always have concerns. I didn't know enough. I needed to do more. And that kind of fueled me in a good way to keep studying more and developing my knowledge and, you know, taking my qualifications further from to qualify from being a nutrition coach to go and sell into me as a nutritionist and then doing some more stuff around health psychology and stuff like that, just to, just to like fill my nutrition toolkit as fastly as I could. And I suppose I'll never stop doing that, but that's kind of, that would be pretty much my journey. Yeah. I am now. And then the marketing got kicked to the curb and then, yeah. <laughs> I suppose you can still kind of use the marketing for yourself, can't you? You can, there's, I think every single line of work that you'll ever do, anything you do, you can take something from, you know? Yeah. There's definitely elements of every single thing I've done throughout my life work-wise from working in bars and restaurants for such a long period of time, working with the public, learning to read people, talk to people, communicate, to bring to marketing, to now being in nutrition there's there's something to be said for all of it and how you can what you can take from all of it and bring together you know nothing really is wasted on a journey no i think you're totally right and i think people underestimate maybe the effects or the things they've learned from previous jobs or different life experiences is is there a particular area of nutrition you tend to deal with so i think it's always so prominent when it comes to when people come to me to work with me the majority of people will come with a fat loss goal, you know, yeah. that is that like I work with a broad range of clients, but that would be the primary goal that most people have coming. The more people have gotten to know me and know the message I put out and the type of work I do, I do get a lot more people who really have been through the mill and, you know, been caught in diet culture for so long. They're on that cycle of diet, on diet, off diet, on plan, off plan. And they're just sick of it. They need something different. They need something new. They're not really sure what to do. They feel a bit lost. And they want something that's more sustainable. And they come to me knowing that that's kind of the message that I talk about a lot is trying to create sustainable change. Like I'm a big believer in there's nothing wrong with having fat loss goals. There's nothing wrong with wanting to change your body composition or make change. But it's how you do it, why you do it, you know, and making sure that it's for you and for the right reasons and that health is at the forefront of it and yeah, always yeah. an underlying message in it. So I do think that I would get a lot of clients who are willing to approach things a different way, you know, and to hear a different viewpoint and that, you know, that they want to really make sustainable change. They're not just going to get a cookie cutter kind of program. Oh yeah. But I think the cook, well, no, they're probably not, but I don't, I don't follow people anyway who do stuff like that anymore so in my head they're dead but I know like there's probably other people following them when they're everywhere yeah, we get so blinkered when like I do know how, like that's something I've noticed I was actually saying to like Shane and Stephen who I work with and that as well it's like we get so bl- you get so blinkered sometimes in the industry when you don't follow a lot of people who talk a lot of shit you know or like people who are just like the snake oils and fads and stuff like that and quick fixes you forget that it's just so prominent that it's so huge that until you talk to your clients until you talk to like your friends and family who may not be in the industry and you realize that it is still really strong and really prominent but we just live in we kind of live in the evidence based kind of you know compassion bubble and who you follow and who you've interested in and clean up your own like feed to involve to have that kind of vibe about it but unfortunately there's still there's still a lot of issues out there in the industry a lot of issues in the industry so yeah. <laughs> we're just hiding from them 
Yeah. Like, don't want to see them. Can't see. Yep. Can't see. <laughs> I'm the exact same like that. I, I genuinely am myself convinced it was all gone. And then I remembered really, really recently, I was like, hold on, I follow this person, this person, this person. None of them do that. So that's how I think that now. But it's such a nice, like, calm environment to read that and go, yeah, that's 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 much better. Blissful. <laughs> yeah. Just ignoring that. It's not happening. But yeah, unfortunately, when you get the message gets through, it's like you have to kind of protect yourself a little bit. Yeah. You get so angry, especially when you see people get hurt by these messages. When you have, like, some of the stories I've had clients bring to me, I've heard from people of what they've been told, and it breaks your heart because you just see so much confusion, you know, and like mm. people literally feel like they're broken, like they can't do anything right. And the knock on effect and impact of that and how it makes you feel about yourself and your self-worth is huge. And you see that so frequently and that, that kind of like, you have to protect yourself from it to a degree because you need to be strong and able to like handle that. You're going to have people coming to you who have been let down by the diet industry and just doing your best to treat them with compassion and try and prepare that and show them that there is a different way, you know, might take a bit of patience, might not be the easiest route. It's definitely the unsexy side of nutrition because it's not a quick fix and you have to be ready for that. And that's like, you know, and that's all you can do is just keep on keeping on and trying to put out a good message. Yeah, exactly. Uh, how do the clients, when they come to you, find that, like, your approach? Because obviously your approach is much more, like, balanced, you know, like I said, it's health-focused. It's not, we're going to lose 10 pounds in 10 days. It's, um, or are they kind of expecting it going to be a longer journey from your content? Or do they just kind of go, can we not do it quicker? Or how does it? You get half and half. You get, yeah. like, those who are aware and are ready to make the change and commit to a gentler process, like a, a, a more drawn out process. And then you have those who want to be ready to do that, but then just cannot manage their expectations and find it really difficult. And that's not their fault. It's like it's ingrained in us to want to see change quickly and to have those expectations because we see so much out there of like 10 pounds in 10 days, six week abs, all this, that it's very difficult not to have those expectations of mm. yourself and your body, especially if you're especially if you're paying someone to help you to do that. So even if you want to commit to making long-term change and you know, you know that's what you should want and you'll come to someone and tell them that's what you want, but deep down inside, you want to lose 10 pounds in 10 days because you want this to be quick and over and done with and don't really want to have to face the long-term change. So you get that a lot in people as well. And sometimes it does come down to giving someone what they want a little bit initially to get the buy-in to give them what they need long term if, you, if that makes yeah. sense yeah yeah i get you yeah 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 sometimes we will like because obviously like we, we will use like it depends like i would work with clients who have a really good relationship with food who are in a good place you do generally just want to lose weight a little bit quicker and i know they're in a good enough place to do it or i've worked with them for a long time that we've put tools in place where they can maintain it you know people are all very very different um mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you do kind of need to give someone a little bit of what they want then, you know, and like kind of say, okay, you know what, we're going to track, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But while you're doing that, would you work on these little behaviors behind and I'll like sneak in the little things behind it and then kind of they're slowly building in those foundations behind the initial fat loss goal. Mm -hmm. And then they're more confident in the fact that they will put trust in me and know that I can do that with them and for them at any point in the journey if we need to they see that that's feasible and that they can do it and then there's more confidence and comfort in kind of going all right yeah like no we, we can take the steadier approach now so there's a lot of psychology involved <laughs> would you say that that puts more there's more psychology than actual food so much like you know as i say like although it's kind of used it's like you know I don't know where I heard it from. I know it wasn't mine originally, but it's kind of like that, you know, fat loss in particular, in principle, it's easy, but in people, it's really, really complicated. And that's yeah. because, yeah, yeah, you can just go with energy balance, calories in, calories out, that's shy say here, and like it's really simple. But it's not simple. It's really complicated. It's really, really difficult. And that's because of so many factors, psychology being one of them, but like there's so many other 
broad ranging factors in humans and like our environment, our culture, you know, like your social class, all these things impact it. So there's, it makes it really, really complex and complicated. And that's why people need to realize that, yeah, like there's a variety of methods we can use and yeah, there, we're all human and the principles are the same with everyone, but how we make it happen and how we make it sustainable and work for them has to be very tailored and personal. And that's, that's the thing that gets forgotten about sometimes in the industry is it's becoming more and more apparent. It's brilliant looking around that like there's a lot more people singing from the hymn sheet that we're singing from these days, yeah. which is brilliant. There's so many people that I look up to in the industry and, you know, with loud voices who are well listened to and heard that are, are singing from that hymn sheet, but it's still very confusing for people. I think, what do you think is the biggest struggle that they tend to have? I think probably the biggest struggle, ooh, there's lots of them. I think that, you top three if you want. <laughs> like, what would be the, the biggest ones? Um, probably, I think it's like dichotomous thinking, like all or nothing thinking is huge with people on plan, off plan. If I can't be perfect, I'm terrible. Like that's a huge, yeah. hugely apparent I see with people. It's kind of like, I was good versus I was bad. It's like, you see a lot of that language and how people speak to themselves, a real lack of compassion. There is like a lot of confusion there and people like in, in being compassionate with themselves and understanding that, that it's okay to be compassionate and a misguided view of what compassion is, not realizing that, well, compassion isn't just all self-care and soft, like compassion can be radical, compassion can be setting boundaries, you know, it can be saying no, it can be, it can be being disciplined when you're not feeling motivated because you love yourself and you care about yourself and you want to be healthier you know there's a there's a real lack of that and I would say managing expectations of themselves as well like people have so many ideas of what they should be doing what results they should be getting you know that would be something I would I would meet with quite quite a lot with clients and stuff like that and just so much freaking confusion yeah so so much confusion and like self-doubt that they're just that feeling of being broken of that nothing works for them and lack of awareness of what what is the right way to go or even of their own habits and behaviors of just so 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 much confusion about what direction to go in that they just feel quite lost and then they get they get really stuck in like mindless behaviors and um, which direction to go in does where do you think that kind of thing comes from all the confusion or is it just like we're just getting thrown a new diet every every month that fixes it i think like a lot of the confusion comes from society in general like the media has a massive role to play but i think even before like social media and mass media as we know it it's always been something that was quite apparent and i do think that diet culture has a huge part to play in it um media upbringing like we've been given so many messages particularly like this across the board for men and women but particularly as women i believe we've been given so much throughout our life to tell us that we need to be quieter we need to be smaller you know we need to have either need to be either leaner or have bigger boobs or a bigger butt or whatever like every generation there's something that we need to be but it all stems from us having to change who we fundamentally are, us having to change something about ourselves, us having to be more attractive, you know, more appealing, primarily to like the male kind of eye and stuff like that, which are being drawn. I know this sounds like I've gone on a complete rant about something no, no. in the direction, but it really does stem from a lot of like patriarchy and media and just the idea of, it's like that women have to be that way. And we're told it from a very young age, you know, and it's, really really deep inside of all of us no matter how woke we think we are no matter how you know if like you're like into feminism you are no matter where you are and all this there are some ingrained ideas of being like lean white you know these things are going to give you privilege you know being society standards of beauty if you meet with them more you get a certain amount of privilege in your life. You get treated a little bit better. And I do believe that that's something that is ingrained in so many 
women in particular's minds in our subconscious from a young age that that's what we should want to be that that's how we should be and life will be easier life will be better if we look that way if we act this way if we do this and um, where you're fighting against that against that intrinsic idea in your head that's been ingrained from the media from society from people you love around you and it's nobody's fault it's like it's a cycle that's just perpetuated year and year and year and the media doesn't want us to break it because you know keeping women thinking they're too fat you know too ugly their hair's not right their skin's not right we need to shave everything we need to do this do that keeping us thinking that that we need to do all these things to fit in to fit these standards makes a hell of a lot of money for like cosmetics beauty media fitness industry nutrition all of these industries make a lot of money off that and this is now like i'm talking like about women primarily but obviously this has an impact on men too who have their own set of standards that they want to live up to now like fitness industry like body types that are unattainable for the majority of men as well the eating disorders the, like the biggest growing demographic is men in their 30s and 40s with like binge eating and stuff so obviously society and everything going on in it's having an impact on all sexes you know on everybody you know and like there's discrimination so many different walks and ways of life but i do believe that that has a huge impact on why people feel this way why there's so much confusion because i think you end up with such a conflicted idea in your head of that you like you know that you should be really you should be hard on yourself to achieve anything and if you're not hard on yourself you're being too soft and you're lazy so you're stuck in that but then everyone's telling you self-care and self-compassion is better for you but if i'm not hard on myself i'm not going to be driven and i'm going to be lazy but i should love myself but loving yourself is conceited and these ideas are so confusing for everyone. It's so easy for us all to talk about it, myself included, like self-care, do this and all. But when I really think about it and I talk to so many different people and read so many di- from so many different directions, I like to challenge my own thinking quite a lot and mm. read a variety of books and challenge things I do and stuff just to learn, not to be critical, but just to learn. And it's so bloody confusing for people. It's like we can all think we're helping sometimes, but sometimes it just gets more and more confusing for everyone. I think that that's a huge, huge part of it. So yeah. like, you've got culture, upbringing, society, social class, environment, you know, all these things are impacting how we feel about ourselves and think about ourselves. And then this media monster, which is like something that's hugely beneficial to us all in one way, but it has a huge, huge impact on how people feel about themselves and the control it has on the masses and on how we feel about our bodies, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about everything that we do, if we're earning enough money, if we're a good enough partner, you know, managing expectations of being the best mom, being the best dad, being able to do everything, expectations of what sex should be like, all these different things that we're just putting all these like pressures on ourselves to be so much more than necessary or is even feasible for one human you know yeah no you're absolutely right do you see like different trends with different age groups or is there all kind of a similar underlying theme with it i definitely think there's a similar thread Mm -hmm. and it is usually of not being enough without things you know i think that that thread kind of winds through it all it's like trying to live up to some ideal or that you're being portrayed with. I think, I feel like when I look at the media, it goes in waves. I think things are getting better and moving forward. And then you'll look at it, like I look, I look at generations below me and it'll be like, yeah, they're getting more woke. They're getting more wise. There's so much better stuff out there, you know? And then you'll see the generation impacted by TV shows like Georgie Shore and Love Island, a lot of these shows. And like, yeah. I, I love a good bit of mind candy, like a good bit of trash sometimes. It can't help but like sometimes. Oh, yeah. I love Jordy Shore and it was out. Yeah. You know, it's hilarious. But my, when I like would look at, looked at it initially just as a show and watched, I would laugh at it and think it was deadly. Then I'd see a lot of those young men and women online or like stories about them and stuff. 
and watch their bodies slowly change and watch their faces slowly yeah. change and then the surgery they were getting all these things and we're looking at people who are like 10 years younger than me and kind of going they don't even look like themselves anymore like and for me that like cries out especially with my studies through the years and the areas like I dive, delve into when it comes to nutrition and well-being and stuff and it's like um, screens like body dysmorphia and like having these ideals that they need to look a certain way and they all end up nearly looking the same they do like, don't they everyone ends up being carb coffee and doing so much of themselves and obviously like I have nothing against surgery I've just had surgery myself like <laughs> so so I'm not judging, like, and this is no criticism. It's like, do you and do what is right for you for the right reasons. So search within yourself and make a choice and understand it, you know. But when you see these young, young people doing so much to themselves and, like, behaving in ways like that, when I was, like, their age, it was like social media wouldn't have been as rife. So, like, you kind of do things and it wasn't everywhere. Nowadays, someone does something and it's everywhere and you can't get rid of it. It's all over social media. It's online. It goes around to everybody. And it's scary to think of the impact that that could have on them. And I do think that that's, I don't envy the generation. The, like, like, I have a niece who's nine. And mm-hmm. I just hope, hope to God things start changing in the next few years a little bit. And like, I see her now and like, she's very much herself and her own identity. She's daddy. And I'm kind of like, never change. <laughs> you stay like that. <laughs> Yeah, you stay that way. <laughs> um, but I do fear for like younger people with the way society is going a little bit. It's so strange out there. The world is no less confusing. It's getting more and more confusing in so many ways. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually glad as well I didn't grow up with social media. Like I think Facebook came kind of came to Ireland when I was 18. So like no. <laughs> and even then it was just pictures and you know when you get your memories and you're reading your wall and you're like who wants to go in a sesh tonight and I'm like oh god what was I at <laughs> but like that's the worst I have to worry about you know Same. um but yeah the what you said is all about the Geordie Shore and you're like right there's nothing wrong with surgery but they are they're just like just constant as every time you see them something's changed isn't it and you know it's because they're constantly under scrutiny as well yeah because like that they're not just before like I say when we would have been growing up maybe it was like magazines and you know you'd have one magazine article ripping the piss out of you but you'll have 10 magazine articles they'll all be online and three people will be tweeting you saying it like and they're not equipped for it like they're not psychologically equipped for it they're so young you know you don't get me like media training or like psychological support that they need they're thrown out to the world to let vultures at them to make money. You know, it's like looking at like a lot of like manufactured boy and girl bands through the years and go way, way back. A lot of these people, they're products. They're just products to make money from. There's no consideration for them as people. And the public are vicious. Like the media are vicious, but the public are vicious. Like a person is kind and has empathy one-to-one when you see that person as a person and you're in front of them. When you look at online, trolls people like keyboard warriors they don't give a flying feck <laughs> can i swear no, <laughs> say whatever you want they don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. about these people and about the harm that they can do them and the psychological impact that their words have people are vicious you know a person can be found with people in masses when you have people get together in a group in particular like it's vicious and no matter how strong someone thinks they are You've got a young person getting this venom thrown at them constantly and they have no, no training, no understanding, no psychological support to help them get through that. It's going to destroy them. And you've seen it happen time and again, like with people who, you know, are famous or semi-famous or like flash in the pan famous, like this, out the reality TV and like the negative paths they go down and then they're judged for, they're like, they're out drinking, they're out doing whatever shocker like they they're using these escape routes you know they're doing things to help them escape and their you know their weight goes up and down and all these things and like yeah when someone's in cycles of like trying to hide away from their feelings and stuff these things are going to happen and you see people getting just torn to shreds and it's it's hard not to judge we all tend to do that like a little bit but if people start checking themselves a little bit more and trying to have a bit more empathy and understanding for other people and the whys behind their actions, 
and what's going on and just kind of curb the, the viciousness and the attacks a little bit. But yeah, I think I live in a fantasy world. I think that that's going to, that's going to Yeah, it, it is like, and I'm like, I'm not saying, say, for instance, you're perfect for it. Like I have done it, looked and like, mm. and I have to try and catch myself every time. Like, why do you think that? Is there really something wrong with this person? Or are you just, are you jealous? Are you mad? They're more like, you know, or what's triggered you it's not them they've not done anything they've no idea you're up to anything exactly and that's the thing it's like it's not to try and expect that you're never going to think shitty things like i think awful things i'm like i can be a right spot sometimes you know what i mean like like all of us can we all hurt people we all get hurt you know it's like we're human there's going to be so many things influencing our behavior day in day out but it's trying to learn from it. i think it's just having the awareness and the understanding to be able to stand up and say sorry when you fuck up and to be able to like make amends in that way and understand the reactions of others or to try and learn from your mistakes, learn from your behaviors, kind of try and be kind and curious and explore why you might think certain things. Because a lot of the time when we dislike someone for no reason, it's kind of remind us of something about ourselves or something that we dislike within ourselves or something that we don't want to face within ourselves. There's usually some connection when it's about you and you know, sometimes you can really help yourself work on something you need to work on. And I know that's so easier said than done. And I'm, I'm doing that thing where I'm saying things that like for most people who will be listening, we kind of go, yeah, that's a nice idea. And I think that's the really daunting thing about self-exploration or even being mindful and all those different things is that it just seems like this big, huge undertaking. And it's not, it's like, it's accepting just those simple little changes, those simple little things of not expecting that you're never going to think these things again, not expecting that you're never going to do these things again, not expecting that your behaviors, thoughts, and ingrained ideas in your head are just going to change overnight. But just that little bit more awareness, that pause, that stopping and reflecting and considering, the more and more you do it, the more and more you practice it, the more, like, you know, it's like rewiring circuits in your brain. You just slowly start to view things a little bit differently, you know? And I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned is like with managing my expectations of myself and being kinder to myself over the years is like to realize that it's a really long ongoing process. Yeah. Like, and it never changes. I'll never stop learning. I'll never stop fucking up. There'll always be mistakes, but I can do it better and I can not hold it over my head like I am I am terrible I am this you know it's instead of I get I can get I get I get embarrassed but I don't get think like I don't feel ashamed you know yeah, yeah. I just I did something wrong not I am wrong I am not like you know I did something bad not I am bad it's more that kind of mindset these days that I would have with things it's like yeah be accountable you did something wrong but you are not wrong, you are, you are enough. And that's kind of the, the shift in mindset that I really think is worth working towards and just making those small efforts to reframe your thinking. Yeah, it's not comfortable, it's not fun. So <laughs> you just, just have to identify it. <laughs> yeah, reflection's never fun. It's like, it's, it's like, it's all, it sounds all peace, love and light, but <laughs> it's also a lot of, there's, there is a bit of pain in there, but you know, change is uncomfortable as fuck. Like change always is, even when it's positive change and when you're doing things for good reasons, there's always a bit of discomfort there. There's always that fear and uncertainty, you know, that you have. It's like those little, the little those little tummy feels, a little bits of anxiety. It's like an amplified version of like, when you're going out in a night out and you know, you're excited about it, you also feel kind of anxious. Yeah, that's people and stuff. I hope that's not just me that gets that. Like, no, that happens to me all the time, especially after lockdown and living in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are getting that. Like going back to the gym, they're so excited to get back and see everyone. But I've spoken to clients and they're like, "Why do I feel so anxious about it?" And like, it's fear of their body. It's fear of seeing people. It's fear of air. it's all these different like fears, kind of anxiety. And I, I was like, that reminds me of when I used to go out and write down. I used to think I was quite social, but then I realized that no, I used to get, I used to get super anxious before like seeing people are going out, and it's just like uncertainty. Yeah, that not having control over what might happen or what's going to happen. I think leaves people feeling a little bit the feely feels or screaming. Yeah. No, that's so true. Um, those feely feels. <laughs> those feely feels. <laughs> I like this. I'm gonna call Technical it that. Term. Technical. Yeah. <laughs> that's how we describe anxious excitement. It's called the feely feels. <laughs> feely feels. Yeah. <laughs>
I love that. I live my life driven by them. <laughs> do, you, do you find actually uh, clients think that once they sort these kind of issues, it'll be gone forever or like not that it'll be an ongoing process? So for instance, like food issues, they're never going to have a wobble. Yes, there is that expectation that again, all or nothing. It's like, all right, we're going to do this and we're going to fix it all. It's kind of like, I think there's like, there's a double-edged kind of sort of this. It's kind of like they look at, they've been built to believe that anything to do with diet or fat loss or fitness is going to be painful. So they're, they're geared up for short pain. You know, short, like, I'm going to have to restrict everything. I'm going to have to like run and walk loads and train really hard in the gym. And then I'm sorted. And they don't realize the after, after which is like the tough bit. So there, there's a capacity to be willing to suffer, but for a very short period of time, yeah. there's so much willingness to do that. There's kind of a thought that if it isn't painful a little bit, if it isn't difficult or restrictive enough, that they're not doing it right. Like I, I've gotten that a lot where it's just like, well, this isn't, this isn't really suffering. I'd be like, are you still losing, losing body fat? Is your body composition changing? Like, yeah then you're doing it right. Like you, you get the results you want. It's just you're not suffering and starving yourself and you're allowed to eat whatever you, like, food you want. Right back. Isn't, isn't this enjoyable? Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> yeah, isn't it different? And I think that's the that's problem for people is that they're expecting short pain, fast results, and then long-term fixed. But instead of like, you know, slower results, occasional discomfort when they have to go again and again and again and hit the wobbles and not feel like when they hit a wobble or a difficult where you need to take a break. Like progress isn't linear or something. I always say to clients, it's like, you're going to have up, stem, sideways. You're going to have to stop. Life's going to get in the way and you have to manage your expectations of that. And it's having that more flexible mindset. We try and foster a more flexible mindset where you're resilient enough when you're more when you're more flexible it's like you don't bend you break you know yeah. it's like in everything in our physical fitness and strength if you're if you're not flexible your strength is impacted the same with your mind if your mind isn't flexible like you're it's not as strong you need to be able to bend and break and that a bend or you break so we try to foster that by the difficult bits being the wobbles kind of expect them kind of need them to help foster that more flexible mindset because if something if it's all going perfectly and there's no issues and we don't have to talk things through or have me there to help them be more like you know give themselves more empathy be more curious kind kind of look at it and go like let's reflect what can we do to prevent this again you know yeah. and having that understanding of a wobble isn't the end of the world it doesn't stop your progress. It doesn't limit your progress. It's the choices you make afterwards. It's do you stop entirely? You know, do you think you fecked up completely and you're not going to move forward? So we kind of expect wobbles, expect setbacks, expect speed bumps. And then I help them navigate them. So I think it's like the wobbles and the speed bumps are the most difficult thing for people to face mm -hmm. and to understand that they're okay and they're going to happen. Because it's like, but no, I've been working on this. Why is this happening? And it's kind of because you're human. Yeah, you're not a robot. Yeah, you're human. So this is going to happen. So yeah, it's definitely the managing expectation side of things. Yeah. Do, they, do they think you're immune from them as well? Yes. People think you've kind of got it sussed. And I think that's something as a coach, I'm sure you've been there yourself where, you know, you feel like you're not enough because you're still battling with your own demons and dealing with your own shit. And I know up until a few years ago, that was something I struggled with, shockingly, like with imposter syndrome, with not feeling like I could be enough or do enough for my clients, you know, constantly when I knew I had some of my own issues were nigging away in the back of my mind and, you know, I was having my own difficulties. It was like, how the hell can I be, be my best for others if I'm, I can't even do this shit myself, you know? Mm. And that being quite hard on myself and that dichotomous thinking, it's like, I remember like I, I went to counselling um, three years ago, my back two and a half, three years ago, it was incredible for me. And it really was game changing to go back and kind of be a and kind of go, right, I'm struggling. Like I really need, I'm working myself to the bone. I am burning out and I just can't seem to stop. I'm double jobbing, I'm studying at night. I am training, you know, really hard <laughs> um, when you sleep 
yeah and that but I wasn't and that was yeah. the key. I was I was burning myself out and because I had like some personal stuff going on with my, in my, in my personal life and I was like that was tipping me over and I was obviously distracting to a degree from it but in doing so I was burning out and I wasn't dealing with my shit and I was like yeah. you know I, and I saw like the signs of like where I go when I'm not in a good place and stuff like that and I was like right now we're not doing this I'm gonna go to counseling and initially there was that like well I even felt a little bit like even though I knew this was okay to do it's kind of like felt like I was letting everyone down by doing it and yeah. then I realized as I went through the process that I was being so incredibly hard on myself and she pointed out to me she's like you know all this stuff but you're doing it like such dichotomous thinking again I'm like you know really really just not being able to let go of that like I couldn't treat myself like I treat other people like and if someone like empathy for others and like be able to like help through and never judge them and like you know I do practice what I preach in relation to how I treat others but I did not practice it with how I treat myself <laughs> I, I think we're very bad for that, like coaches and stuff like that, aren't they? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, do all this. And then you're like, I'm dying on the inside at the same time. Oh, a hundred percent. And and that's it. It's realizing as a coach we're human, we have struggles, we have setbacks, we have lives, we have histories, we have traumas, we've all we've all got these things in our life. And you know, I think it's important for us to have the awareness to try and support ourselves out of that because it is a case of you know, having to fix your own life mask first, if yeah. you want to be the best for others, for those you love, for your clients, for that, it, it is important to take care of yourself, but also to be kind and like, understand that you're going to mess up, like, yes. it's, it's going to happen, you know, that's Normal. inevitable, like, <laughs> and it's always work in progress, like, it's just never, it never stops, like, you're always going to have to work on yourself and keep learning and be open-minded and open to the opinions and thoughts of others you know change your mind when presented with new facts and stuff it's part of the deal yeah exactly no that's brilliant I think that is so true I think that is everything I have to ask you bar my one question which is I ask everybody which is what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given Ooh. That was at the bottom of the list. <laughs> what is the best piece of advice I've ever been given? You can pick more than one. Oh God, that's really difficult. Best piece of advice I've ever been given. To ask for help is definitely one. Yeah. You know, that asking for help uh, when you need it is, is not weakness. It's actually strength. It's having that willingness to be vulnerable yeah um what else would be something that was really good really positive advice definitely i think my growing up my dad would always would always point out to me that like you know kind of would always say to my mom like the best friend you'll ever have to yourself so you know that like that self-love and kindness and i do believe like initially i never really kind of got that i was just like oh no like I've got actual friends. <laughs> As I get older, I kind of realized that like it really does apply. Like you are, you're you're with you the whole entire of your life. If you don't love yourself and are not kind to yourself and don't have that love for yourself and support, like you can't be anything to anyone else, you know? Yeah. Like you can spend so much time caring so much about the opinions and thoughts of others that you get lost in them and forget to care about your own opinions and thoughts and the value that they have and yeah I think they would be they would be definitely two of the big ones for me asking for help yeah. I wanted to ask for help and then like a lot of the stuff that like my my counselor would have said like with working on feelings of being enough you know yeah that type of stuff would be very very apparent to me that's really really difficult I have to say yeah. I've gotten that reaction a few times. People going, huh? <laughs> it's like, what oh, was the best piece of advice I've ever done? I know I've gotten so much like throughout the years. Not always great, but <laughs> no, and like it's definitely it's like listening to yourself is like really big as well. And like that feeling in my gut when that kicks in. It's, just, it's, it's telling you something. It's it's not lying to you, don't worry. <laughs> it's 
feely feels i'm telling you feely feels yes always listen to the feely feels that is the best piece of advice i've ever been given and i will be <laughs> sad you know? it's gonna be like a sound bite <laughs> Yeah, that would, that would be exciting, maybe just like a figures chain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of got to a podcast and I talked about something like completely dirty, like the last couple I've done, I've had to talk about Lord of the Rings, I think I brought up Star Wars, and then something about computer games. It's just like, for fuck's sake. Well, you've got to mention it now, so you didn't even make sure the full podcast. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> right just before you launch into star wars <laughs> where can everybody find you probably the best place to find me will be instagram so jane underscore real nutrition and that's the easiest place to read asking questions or whatever you may need as ever as ever, with me people you can find me on instagram it's chrissy h fitness and i'm also on tiktok chrissy h fitness <laughs> so thanks again for joining us again jane Thank you very, very much for having me and my tangents on. <laughs> <laughs> and the feely feels. The feely feels. <laughs>Thank you again for listening to the why not podcast it really means a lot that you are listening in and i would love if you could please leave a review on apple Podcasts or subscribe on spotify and always i'd love to hear feedback personally so if you do want to leave me a message and let me know how you found the podcast please do